Hi everyone, good morning. As always, I am so happy to be here and very excited to speak about this topic. The place I'm gonna show you in Israel, I went there, I first went there maybe four years ago and I was so amazed by it. I said, how come I never heard of it before? And, and people always ask me as a tour guide where they should go in Israel, what places I recommend to them. And I was right, I was pushing this place like crazy because no one really ever heard of it either. And I was so inspired by it. So I'm looking forward. And I know I didn't say the name yet to share this new place with you. And if it's not new, then the place that you already know. I'm gonna share my screen. Welcome. Caves. There's something I think since the start of time that has always intrigued human beings about caves, whether it's the dark, cool atmosphere that you could escape the hot sun, or if it's raining, you could escape. I think the mystery of what there is to discover, you go into a cave, you don't know how deep it's going to go. Um, people are fascinated by caves. I think also people might have the opposite approach. If it's too narrow, that they're scared, claustrophobic, what if the roof keeps down on me? So it's uh, a loaded topic and Israel has tons and tons and tons of them. So today I want to speak about a few that are all in the same site. So you can visit them all in one day that I think are absolutely fascinating. So the first question we're going to answer is what and where are the bell caves? The second one is what was a profitable cave business? I know we don't think of caves in business. And the third question I want to focus on is, in what cave can I find a three-headed dog? And of course, always a higher goal is to discover a new place in Israel, because the more we love Israel, the more we love God, the more we love Torah. <laughs> it's a triangle. And uh, another question um, in the background that I want you to focus on is, how can discovering different caves have reflection in our own lives? I, I really believe that visiting places in Israel is valuable in its own right. But I always like to think uh, connected even more, like on a deeper level. So I see someone around the chat, Manat and Atifim. So that is a cave in Israel. We're actually not going to talk about that one today. I was debating, <laughs> but it's not close enough. It's close enough, but it's not to be static. Let me just admit someone into the waiting room. Welcome, everybody. Okay, for those of you that just joined, we're going to be talking about a certain area and caves. One of the things that I love about Israel, and I think everyone loves to, is you could be driving along in a car. You could be in Jerusalem. It could be 40 degrees, really, really cold. And then you drive another 20 minutes and all of a sudden you're in the desert. And then you drive a little bit more and there's mountains. And then you drive a lot more and there's the Chedmon that has snow on it. So you could go to a desert, go skiing, do everything all in one day. And I don't know of any other countries that have so many climates and topography all in one small piece of land. So it's really, you could get everything here. You could live wherever you want, whatever weather speaks to you. And it's just of the many pluses that Israel has, this is a huge one. And the area I wanna focus on today is something known as the Shafela. Shafela, Shafel means low. And this is, you see this green circle. <laughs> That's where it's focused, the area that I'm gonna talk about. Um, here's a map. I put it on the side because we, we're more used to looking at we're used to looking at Israel like this. That here's the Kinneret and the Dead Sea. So this over here, it's considered the Shvela or the lowlands. Low considered to what? So here we have the mountains of Chavron, mountains of Yehuda, and then to the west of that is an area called the Shvela because it's lower hills, and that is the area we're focusing on today. Now, something that I want to mention about the ground of the Shvela is that it's very, very soft. So if you look at the diagram here, so look at number one. And after I put the pictures, I realized I did it kind of in a backwards order because in English, we're used to looking from right to left, from left to right. Anyway, so here there's a layer called Nari, which is hard, very, very hard rock. And this is this characterizes the, the Shvela. So what the people living there would do is they would dig through this hard rock to get to an area called Kirton. Kirton is chalk. Think back to your school days with the chalkboard. It's very, very soft and easy to break, easy to dig through. And because people wanted to get to the soft ground, they you see here this person digging a hole. The hole is not huge because why dig through so much hard rock? Just dig through a little bit of hard rock and then you get to the soft rock. 
So you see that the person is getting deeper down. And now if you look at the way, uh, remember this, this picture, it's gonna be significant later on. Look at this huge space that was created in the soft rock where the entrance from the hard rock is very, very small. Now the Shefela is nicknamed land of the thousand caves because when it's so easy to dig in ground, what are you gonna dig in? You're gonna dig caves. And if anyone, we're not gonna talk about it this Zoom, but I'll just mention it. If anyone has ever crawled through caves with their family, the Bar Kochva caves, that is in this area because when they were hiding from the Romans and they wanted to caves and be underground, you need it to be easy uh, to dig in. So that's in this area, that's the nickname for the Shefela, land of the thousand caves. And you see the whitish color over here, so this is the chalk. First question, what and where are the Bell Caves? In a few years ago, I was with my course, like I mentioned my tour guiding course, and we came to the Bell Caves and I never even heard of them. And I just spent five minutes just looking in awe that, that something like this exists. Now, I, if, no one, if you haven't ever been in them, I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute. It's worth it just to go and see. It, it, it could be a five minute stop. It could be a 20 minute stop or it could be a two minute stop to just go and see, very, very worth it. So wh where is it? I always like picking my center mark as Jerusalem. You drive about 45 minutes to the Shefela. So the area now, I'll say what we're talking about, what it's called, called Bet Guvrin or Manesha. It's a national park, why two names? Because it's two, towns that are very close to each other. So they just kind of join the names. This is where the bell caves are, the bell caves of Bet Gubrim. This is me. <laughs> My hair is a different color than very blonde. And uh, you see from looking at the picture that I'm not in this little dark brown cave where I can barely stand and that's claustrophobic. Look at how wide and big it is. And you see that there's light streaming in. It's not a dark place. And not because there were lights there. It's just light out. And look how you see that there's a really, really high ceiling and whoever took the picture had to take it from really, really far back. Here's another picture of it. You see this huge, huge expanse. Now it's really more than one cave <laughs> joined together. And I also want you to notice, and I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, that there is light coming down from the top and the hole is from the top. I mean, originally the hole was only from the top, but they want people to, be, to, to go in. And even back then, sometimes they'd make another entrance that was easier to access. So these are the bell caves called so because they are shaped like a bell. So here's another picture. It's just amazing that a place like this exists. So, okay. Um, I'm gonna, let's see, here's another one. Okay, I wanna talk about how, about this, and then I'm gonna go back to the other picture. So after I spent my five minutes in, oh, wow, what a cave. The next natural question was, is this man-made? Is this natural? If it's not natural, who dug it, when, why? So I think you could tell from the question that it was dug. This is not natural. I mean, the rock itself is natural, made from God, but the caves itself, human beings made. And if we think back to the diagram where we said they're digging through the hard rock and they're making a water expanse down below, so this is exactly it. So what the people would do is they would dig through the top and they would dig wide enough for one or two people to fit. And then they would get water as they got lower. And they would have these rectangular blocks, which they take through on the rope. And this was how the caves were formed. So they would dig from the top. And that's why there's light coming from the top, because that's originally where the entrance was. What did they do with all the material? They used it to build. <laughs> and eventually, some of these caves were turned into other things for storage or whatever other needs that people would have. But that's how it was dug. When was it dug? It was dug in the 600s, 700s, the end of the Byzantine Empire, beginning of the Muslims. And this picture over here, it says inscription with question mark. A really fun activity you can do if hopefully you go visit with your kids. Other than it just being so cool, there are actually some inscriptions in the cave. It has the name of God, Allah in Arabic inscribed somewhere. There's also a cross inscribed. And the, the Christian inscriptions are higher up because the cave, um, because they were an earlier time period. And later on, when the, the caves got deeper, if they're working on the same cave, Muslim period, the Muslims would do it lower down. So I, I don't know what these people are looking at. It looks to me like they're just looking at a wall. So I said, maybe they found one of the inscriptions. So it's a really fun thing to go and look at the inscriptions in the cave. And uh, something else you will see in the cave. And this, I'm gonna just add to never, ever, ever do this. Because the cave is very soft and it's easy to carve, people carve their names. And 
it's destroying the beauty of the nature. I know people have their personal, they want to leave their mark, but don't do it on a cave. And I remember once I was with a group in the cave and all of a sudden I saw one of the adults covering his name. I almost had a heart attack because I didn't like, I don't know. I thought it's obvious, you know, it's just the carving name in a cave. Um, so I very maturely and nicely <laughs> said, it, you know, let's not do that. So that's something, unfortunately, we'll see on the cave, but not what we should do. So those are the belt caves, really, really cool uh, experience. Now, an amazing thing about caves, especially that they're in Israel, if you come in January in Israel, it might rain. If you come in the summer, um, it might be hot. I know this past week was super, super hot. I didn't really go outside during the day. I went once the sun set and cave is closed. So it's a great place to visit all year round if you need an idea of what to do. And another thing that's really fun, um, how you can make it fun for kids, even more fun than it already is, is give them a flashlight. Kids love flashlights. You give them a flashlight, you see if they can find things in the cave, but also it's dark-ish. So they can shine it around and you made their day. So here, and the Maresha Bet Kuvrin, it's possible to spend an entire day there. Um, I'd say usually after about two hours, people get hungry, they want to go for lunch already, but you can spend a lot, a lot of time there. So it's a great activity and it, it's, it's pretty close to add into your itinerary if you've never done it. Now I'd like to move to the second question. What was a profitable cave business? Another cave that exists in this complex of Bet Kuvrin Manesha, and you notice also how high the ceiling is and how big it is. I also want to call your attention to the circles in the wall. This, what you are looking at is a cave with a special name. It's name, it's called the Columbarium, which comes from the Latin word Columba, which means dove. And over here are homes for doves and people would raise doves. It started during the Hellenistic period, which is right after the Greeks. And this is one of the many caves you will find in the area. It is so much fun to look through. This picture does not do it justice. None of the pictures do because it is so big. If any of you have ever been to Masada, they have this in Masada, but it's not underground, it's overground and in a very, very small scale. So all of a sudden you go to this cave and see these huge things with 2000 different niches for the doves, which is a huge amount. And it's, it's very nicely designed. Why doves? Oh, so here's another one also in the area. Um, it's a little bit different because you see that there's these, they're more triangular, but here they were more square roundish. This is also for doves and it's just, a, I think, really pretty to look at. So why doves? One, doves were used the meat of the dove, the bird, and eggs as food. Their droppings were used as fertilizer and they were also sacrificed in rituals. And we know if we open the Torah, when people would give korbanot and they were birds, they would do torim obeneyona. So doves is, is something that was very common that people would use. And now I want to tell you a really great tale, an alternate tale. Where did the holes in the cave come from? So the practical answer is they came, they, they made them, the humans made them for the doves. But here's another really great story. So we mentioned that it started in the Hellenistic period. And now I want to tell a, a tale. So I'm using the word tale because... Well, you'll say that back then every city would have its own god and the god of Maresha was Aphrodite and she was the goddess of love and beauty and the people of the town they wanted to make a statue in honor of her and it took them many many years to collect enough money to to build the statue that they wanted finally they got the money that they needed and they made this really gorgeous statue of white marble and she had these gold delicate sandals and she and Aphrodite was wearing gold jewelry and, and pink silk clothing. And the real beautiful part was her eyes. She had two huge diamonds in her eyes that sparkled and the people said, we can't leave this gorgeous statue out in the sun. The sun's rays might harm it. Let's put it inside a cave. So they take the statue of Aphrodite and put it in the cave. Now let's put this on the side. In this same town, we have a young couple that's in love, a young man and a young woman. And the young woman, she's the daughter of the rich head of the city. And the young man is a simple shepherd with no money. Now the couple would meet every night and they would discuss how much they love each other and that they want to get married. And they would plan their future, how many kids they're going to have. They picked out the kids' names. But there was one problem that he didn't have any money to marry her. But he said, it's fine, we'll come up with a plan. Now time goes on and he doesn't have any money. 
So he thinks what he should do. Should I go and should I sell? But then if I sell, maybe my love will marry someone else in the meantime. Should I work very hard and save up? But that's going to take too long. And as time goes on, uh, the woman gets frustrated and she says, you don't really love me because if you really loved me, then you would find a way to marry me sooner. And why is it taking so long? And he's very frustrated. He doesn't know what to do. So he goes down to the cave with the statue of Aphrodite. And he starts praying to Aphrodite. Also, I didn't mention that the people of the town, every morning before they went to work, they would go and they would pray to her and for, for luck and for help. And then every evening after they came home, they'd come and pray to her as well. So he goes one night to pray to Aphrodite. And he says, Aphrodite, you're the god goddess of love and beauty. And we're not married because of money. Why is that even a real thing? Please, please help me. And as he's looking at her, all of a sudden he sees the spark in her eye. And he goes, really? You would do that for me? Thanks. So he says, Aphrodite is giving me a sign. She wants me to take out one of her diamond eyes and sell it. So I'll have money to marry the, the woman of my dreams. So he, he comes, uh, he, the next day, he comes after everyone goes to sleep. He comes with a, a chisel and a hammer and he starts working on it. Now, of course, the people of the town were prepared for something like this to happen because the big diamond, so it was really, really glued and tight. And he's working, 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 working all night. The previous night, he also told his girlfriend, we'll call her, we start selling a wedding dress. We're going to get married in a few weeks. And he wouldn't divulge the exact details of the plan, but he said, I have it all covered. So now he's in the cave and he's digging, digging, digging. Finally, he's successful and he gets uh, a diamond out. And now it took him so long that the sun is already beginning to rise and the people are coming in the cave because they're coming to pray. He doesn't know what to do. He quickly digs a hole in the side of the wall. He sticks the diamond in, covers it up and leaves. Now the people come down and they see that Aphrodite's missing an eye and they're horrified. How could someone have desecrated the statue? There's no way we could get enough money to get a new eye. And of course the young man is also mourning with them. So upset, how could this happen? But secretly he's really, really happy because now he, he has a way to marry her. So then he comes back that like the next day he comes back to get the diamond and he can't find it. So he said, that's weird. I thought I buried it there. And then he digs another hole. Still can't find it. And then another one and then another one and then another one. So you get the picture every night. He keeps coming and digging more and more holes. In the meantime, he doesn't find the diamond. The woman marries someone else. And that is the tale of why the cave has so many holes because this man is looking for his diamond. So not, not, it's a tale but I think it's just a really cute way to look at it as well. You learn one through this tale history that the Hellenist Greeks were in this area and it's also really cute. <laughs> so I wanted to share that. I want to mention doves in the Mishnah that the Mishnah talks about Masachet Shabbat, about feeding your animals. And it says what, what animals you need to make sure to feed even before you feed yourselves. And one of the things it mentions at the end, it says, Lifne yone her disiot. And these kind of yonim are doves in the columbarium. There were two ways they raised doves. One was above ground and one was underground. And the ones underground, they, they need to be taken care of more. So Masechet Shabbat, it talks about the importance of feeding them. Just wanted to add that in. But this, I found online. I, I, I want to go and see there how cool it's in the area. It's a, a, an original cave, but it's a little bit too perfect. And how great it's right above the bed. Uh, to be original, but this couple decided that they want to give people an experience of staying in a columbarium and in a cave. So I think it's it, it's actually a great idea to have in a bedroom because you could just stick your stuff, you have stuff you want to put in a night table. So actually, if you're interested in staying in a place like this, it, know that it exists in the world instead of your, your, your uh, hotel that you go to over and over. I think this could be a really great experience. Here is another view of the room. And it says over here in Hebrew, that your dream is coming true in the land of the thousand caves. I just thought it was beautiful and so creative. People are so creative how they thought, let's make a hotel room out of the columbarium in the caves. Okay. Now the next question, the third one is, in what cave can I find a three-headed dog? And all of these caves that we saw so far, the bell caves and the columbarium, they're all within walking distance of each other. So it's, it's really great that you can see all that. Three-headed dog. This cave that you see before you is called the Tzidonit Cave. And it, the first thing that strikes me when I see it is it's really beautiful and decorated and colorful. You'll notice that it has, uh, it's hard to tell from the picture, but these are holes that go in on either side. And you see this triangular pediment over here and also 
back here, you see a triangle. So there was a tension put in design. This is a burial cave. And we know who was buried in the cave. It wasn't Jewish people because of an inscription that we found. And I'm gonna show you the inscription in a minute. How was this cave discovered? So it was discovered in 1902. There were a bunch of people living nearby and they discovered this burial cave and they decided to steal what was in it and sell it. And once they did that, the archeologists stand out and then they came and quickly took pictures of everything to document it. Now, what are they stealing? It's a grave, isn't there just bones? So I mentioned that this grave was not for Jewish people. And there, we're, we're gonna zoom in a little bit and see that a lot of the elements are Greek. And the, the cave was by Sidonian people. Sidon is a place in what's present day Lebanon, non-Jews, but there were also Greeks in the, in the area, influence of culture. And one of the things that the Greeks believed and something they did is they would bury their dead with a coin under their tongue because they believed that they needed the coin to pay their ferry in the underworld to go from the land of, land of the living to the land of the dead. And if they didn't pay their fare, it would become a ghost because they would never be able to fully find rest in the land of the dead. So they would put these coins under the tongues and surrounding people knew that. And they said, I wanna get a gold coin. Let me go undig the dead. I don't know if that's actually what they found but that was one of the things that people would know. So what's the inscription that was found? Now when we find writing, we love it because then we can know for sure what it was. And here it is. So it says Apollo Panis, and notice the name, it's not a Jewish name. Son of Sismaos, head of the Sidonic community in Manasha. So here we have a name of where we are. Loves his nation, does more good than any other person. Ruled for 33 years and died at age 74. This is his burial cave and there were a few generations that were buried there as well. Now, if here I'm zooming in, none of these pictures are original. What happened is we had the original ones and the archeologists ran to take photographs of it. And then the, the cave was vandalized and it was reconstructed based on photographs. So at least they took the photographs, but this is what it, it, it used to look like. I want here, this is um, something that comes from the Greeks, the amphora on either side. And notice these two birds over here, the, the, the job of the, birds is to carry the soul of the deceased. And something you'll see on either side, here's the holes where you would stick the body in, is animals. They are all animals depicted all over the place. Here's another one, here's people in the cave. Someone taking a picture there. Some of the animals are real, some are mythological. This one in the back looks like a mythological creature. And something that's very striking when you visit the cave and maybe a little bit in the picture is, is that the proportions are a little bit off. If I look at this picture, his body looks a little bit long to me. His front leg looks a little bit long. And one of the explanations given for why the proportions were off is because the artist making it, they never actually saw the animals. They would see pictures in a book of the animals. And it's not like back then they could take a photograph and stick it in a book. It was based on what someone drew. So they were doing this based on what they heard, heard that exists in the world. So that's one of the reasons given for why that it's not proportionate, the, the animals. And we come <laughs> to the answer of where could you find a three-headed dog in a cave? Um, I'm thinking now it's a fun challenge to give the kids who could find a three-headed dog or who could find this, who could find that. I really think every place in Israel that adults want to see, if you think a little bit, you could um, come up with the most creative and fun things for kids to do and turn every place into this fantastic experience. I think for adults also it's fun. Who are we kidding? Adults like having fun also. So this is... Um, Sir, Sir, Sir Barris, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. I actually looked up how to pronounce it and I forgot. <laughs> this is a three-headed dog and he would guard the underworld and make sure that only the dead could come in. So he is depicted on the wall as well. Something that we said is in the inscription, it said Manesha. Now, I love, love, love. Out of all the places in Israel I love going to, my top places are places that if I open the Tanakh, I'm going to see the name inside because I love Tanakh and I love going to what's mentioned. And Maresha, luckily for us, is a place that's mentioned the Tanakh. So when you're there with your family, you could open the Tanakh, read the Pesach which I'm going to share with you where it's mentioned and say, this place in the Tanakh that's mentioned, we're there right now. And I get this spark of joy from that happening. So the first place is mentioned in Sefer Yoshua, when Yoshua is dividing all the Nachalot out to the different tribes, Shevet Yehuda, they get an area, one of the, we see over here, one of I just pointed with my finger. I think it's in my finger. One of the cities mentioned is Manasha Ukila, Bachzibu Manasha. So that's where we are now. Another mention 
is that the Chavam, the king of Yehuda, he was fortifying cities against the enemies. And we see over here, so he's building these strong cities. So that's another story, uh, another mention of Manasha. And the third one is there was the battle between the king of Yehuda named Asa and against someone named Zerach Kushi. And it says, He came until Manasha. And now when we found this inscription in the cave, we say, hey, this is really Manasha. So we came to this biblical place. Now I kept switching between the two names, Manasha Bet Guvrin. After the, the Roman period, Manasha was destroyed, and then the city moved later on to Bet Kuvin. And Bet Kuvin is actually mentioned in the Mishnah and the Gemara. So you could, if for those of you that are fans of Mishnah and the Gemara, you could open that up and show those references, but they're really close nearby, so they're kind of joined together. Now I want to throw in a bonus. This is not a cave, but you cannot go all the way to Bet Kuvin, Manasha, and, and not visit this. <laughs> Look at this picture. I think I already gave away the answer. If I asked you where was it taken, you see ruins. It kind of, I'm going to say it kind of looks like the Colosseum and the fact that they're both amphitheaters, but the Colosseum, you know, we have it in our mind pictures of what it looks like. But I, I want to draw the parallel because if you do not get a chance to go to Rome and you only go to Edith Israel every single vacation of your life, which is fantastic. It's fantastic to go to Rome too. I've been there a few years ago. You can see this, and this is an amphitheater. Now, here's in Bet Kuvrin. Here's a, another picture of it. Uh, people often they use the words theater and amphitheater interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. A theater was for plays, an amphitheater was for gladiators, fights among animals, fights among people, animals and people. And something you'll notice is the wall over here, how high it is. You can't tell from the picture, but you could take my word that it's nine feet high because when the fights were going on and, and the, the Romans built this, they didn't want the animals to be able to jump up at the crowd or people to be able to escape. Also, this is called the arena. Um, arena comes from, it, it's made of sand, so it could soak in the blood of the people that were killed there. And there's 30, over 3,500 seats, 11 rows. And this is something you could see at Bet Kuvrin. Now, something that I really like is how accessible it is. And it's it's really the only um, amphitheater in Israel that's open to the public like this, that it's such a great state. 95% of what you see is not touched. I mean, this was all rebuilt, but this is all original. Now, there are other amphitheaters in Israel. If you go to Bet Sha'an, for example, I wanted to zoom on that. There's an amphitheater there. However, usually, in, in, in Israel, at least, they would build something and then they'd change it into an amphitheater. But here, it, it, it's an original purpose. And even very cute how they did. You see here the voting if the person should live or die, which is what happened at the end of the Gladiator Games. And it's just a, a fun place to be. You can think of a lot of fun games to do there. How was it discovered? By accident in 1981, there were people from the kibbutz nearby of Bet Guvrin that they saw this dome and they called a, a professor over and right away he said, I think this is from an amphitheater and they dug it out by 1995 and this was all covered in sand. The last question I want to ask is were there Jewish gladiators? And we know that there were. So if we open up Chazal, Chazal called them Ludim based on the Latin word ludius, which meant players. And Shimon ben Lakish, Resh Lakish, mentioned all the time in the Gemara, was a gladiator. And then eventually he left the gladiator life and became Resh Lakish and a rabbi. And according to Masafet Kitin, he sold himself to Ludim. So we know that he was. Also, there's accounts, not necessarily by Jewish sources, but by others talking about um, fights. Here's another Jewish source in the Yerushalmi were Jews allowed to go to gladiator games to allowed to watch something? So I didn't include the opinion before, but there's opinion before that says, no, you can't. Here it says someone is in an amphitheater, it has a shafech tamim, it's killing you, you can't watch it, it's a sword. Then, Rabbi Natan mitir bipnei shnei devalim. But Rabbi Natan says Jews can go watch the games for two reasons. One, because at the end, when, they're, when you're voting if the guy should live or die, so he could scream, Zavach is scream and save the people. He could save the gladiator that's going to die. And the second reason, and the third one, that if the person is in fact killed and you were there and this guy was married, then you can tell his wife that the husband was killed and the, the wife won't become an agonan, she can get married again. 
So this is mentioned in the Talmud Yerushalmi, so we see that it was a thing also, unfortunately, that Jews were gladiators as well. And you see this picture in Bet Govin of the two people fighting, which is, is cute that it brings it, makes it more real. And here's the picture we saw before of the royal family. You can go under the amphitheater seats, and I like how it's so accessible. It's real so chilled, and you can just go and climb on these things and see these things where in other country countries <laughs> you maybe can't do that. So it's also fun to go under the seats. And the last thing I want to mention about Bet Guvin is they actually have a bike path where you could go around the entire trail. So it could also be a really fun way. If you get exercise, you could also walk it, but you could bike around, stop from place to place, see what it has to offer. So that's another idea. Now I'd like to summarize. So we opened up talking about caves and how caves have always interested humans forever, the, the mystique of the caves. We discussed the topography of Israel, how you could get any type of environment driving around, you don't even have to drive very far. And the area we focused on today was the Shvela, which is very, very soft rock, hard layer of Nari with soft rock, which is why there's so many caves because of the East Dig. We, the first cave we visited was the Bell Caves, which we dug from on top. And we see in the picture over here, the beautiful shape of it. Profitable cave business. We spoke about the reason of doves and we saw in the columbarium, the holes, there were two stories that we, told one was the practical one, the real one of how the holes are built. And then we, we shared another nice tale about Aphrodite. We saw the Sidonian cave, which was a burial cave and it was just beautiful to see all, all the pictures and the different animals. Biblical Manasha. Manasha is mentioned in the Tanakh for Tanakh lovers. And a bonus that's in the area also of Beth Guvrin is an amphitheater. Spoke about Jewish gladiators, that such a thing did exist. And finally a bike trail. So to, to emphasize the name, this wonderful place in Israel that I hope you go and visit. It's called Bet Guvrin or Manasha. And I'm also going to mention that it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I feel like I've been doing a lot of them, mentioning World Heritage Sites. The UN recognizes how special the formations are, how beautiful it is. Um, it's also on their list. About 16 of them in Israel. And the last question that I just want to answer is, we said we'll keep in the back of our mind, how can discovering different caves have a reflection in our own lives? And when I go to caves, especially these, the, the first thing that strikes me is how cool it is. And it's the secret underworld and, and who knows what you could discover and what there is. And then if I take a minute and, and ask that question to myself, I, I literally could ask, what do I have in my life that's undiscovered that needs further exploration, a talent I want to tap out more, something I want to discover even more. And I, what worlds exist that I don't know about in, in myself or in other people or just out there. So that, that's something that I think about sometimes when I go to caves. And I want us to ask ourselves what parts of us are still uncovered, what could we explore and learn, learn about ourselves. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you take a trip to Beth Govin and Madasha and have an amazing day. Thank you. How how close are these caves to the Stalicite caves? Do you know uh, it's a drive. Um, I'd say like a twenty five minute drive. Uh huh. Maybe even less, but it's the same area. Yeah. Okay. Because you definitely taught me again something new. Th these caves I did not know about at all. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Thank you. You're welcome. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.